We're in the middle of our ongoing analysis on the problem on Paul and the law, and that is the differing and seemingly contradictory nature of his statements on this particular subject. And um, among those solutions that have a harmonizational approach, in other words, they assume that Paul does have a coherent uh, view of the law, a coherent theology of the law, we've looked at a couple of approaches through um, the analysis of different distinctions. We've looked at the Reformed answer, which distinguishes between three types of law. And uh, last time we looked at um, the distinction that E.P. Sanders made, not so much about Paul uh, as about Judaism, but the distinction between getting in and staying in. Now we move on to a uh, yet fourth distinction, and that is the difference between viewing the law as normative revelation, so God's revealing his will, a will that is normative for us, and that, as opposed to that, uh, viewing the law or references to the law as national boundary markers. And this distinction is more uh, likely familiar to you under the user-friendly heading, the new perspective, or as it often is called, the new perspective on uh, Paul. Now before we go any further, um, I, my sense is that uh, people are way too often confused in this discussion because they haven't distinguished between the what I'll call the MPJ and the MPP. What am I talking about? I'm talking about um, the new perspective on Judaism, that's the position that Sanders ushered in, and that of the new perspective on Paul. And although these two things are connected, they nevertheless are also distinct. And so it's very important in our mind conceptually that we keep in mind the claims of Sanders and others who agree with him about Judaism from the subsequent step then of claims dealing with Paul. Now a couple of uh, introductory remarks before we look at two key figures associated with the new perspective. And that is again that distinction that I just highlighted for you, but again permit me to talk about how the two are dependent upon each other. So the new perspective on Judaism ushered in a new perspective on Paul. And yet, though they're distinct from each other, the one is logically dependent on the other. And so if there are some problems with the NPJ, that is the New Perspective on Judaism, well then obviously that has some implications then for the so-called New Perspective on Paul. Now, the phrase New Perspective for a long time was thought to have originated with this guy, James, uh, otherwise affectionately known to us New Testament geek types as Jimmy Dunn. And uh, it was attributed to uh, a speech that he gave um, in uh, the Manson Memorial Lecture in 1982. And um, John kind of marketed himself with this phrase. Uh, the New Perspective is used in a number of his articles and uh, books that he published, The New Perspective on, on Romans or on Galatians. But actually, it really is the case that the phrase goes back to Tom Wright. And uh, Dunn has just, uh, so to say, conceded this point in a recent book of uh, Tom Wright on justification. And so Tom Wright actually used it, you can see the date a few years earlier in 1978. It wasn't in the title of his paper, but he used it in his paper, and it so happened that uh, Jimmy Dunn was sitting in the front row. And whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, Dunn picked up this phrase, uh, which originated with Wright and uh, then was developed or popularized by the writings of Jimmy Dunn. Um, sometimes these things do happen accidentally. I remember um, uh, a lullaby I would sing to my kids. Uh, I had this uh, melody that I thought I invented and I had some very simple words aimed at our kids and I was singing this to all of our kids when they were very small and I was deeply uh, disappointed to find out somewhere down the road that actually this melody already existed. And so that often happens. Sometimes we hear something and uh, you know it registers in our mind and without even being aware that we've borrowed it from somewhere else, we take ownership of it ourselves. So, however that went for Jimmy Dunn, um, technically the phrase new perspective goes back to Tom Wright, uh, though again popularized by Jimmy Dunn. Another introductory comment has to do with the title, the new perspective. This thing that we're about to talk about has been around for, well, almost 30 years, right? E.P. Sanders' work, which isn't quite the same, but is the foundation for the new perspective on Paul, dates to 1977. And so these views have been out there for a while, and so they're not so new anymore. And the other important thing is, is that this new perspective 
really is rather limited in terms of its content or subject area. There are huge areas of theology, biblical or Pauline theology, that have nothing to do or are in no way impacted by this discussion. Sometimes students are a little disappointed, depending on how much uh, uh, press you've heard about the new perspective on Paul. It's a rather narrow discussion, although those involved in this narrow discussion often speak with very uh, great passion and with, uh, with great uh, heated uh, animism in their voice, and so they feel strongly about these things. Also, the new perspective. Um, that might suggest that everybody who adopts this position all sing the same tune, right? There's a kind of monolithic group and they all argue and believe the same thing and that's simply not the case. Uh, Tom Wright, for example, uh, tries to make this point at the beginning of his recent book on justification. He says, there is no such thing as the new perspective. There's only a disparate family of perspective, some with more, some with less family likeness, and with family squabbles and sibling rivalries going on inside. Indeed, anyone giving close attention to the work of Ed Sanders, Jimmy Dunn, and myself, for some reason we are often mentioned as the chief culprits, why not Richard Hayes, or why not Douglas Campbell, or Terry Donaldson, or Bruce Longenecker, Anyone who has looked carefully at our writings will see that we have at least as much disagreement between ourselves as we do with those outside this very small and hardly charmed circle. And so um, we shouldn't assume in the new perspective that Dunn and Wright and others in this camp all feel and think and say exactly the same thing. Well. With those introductory comments, let's look then for a few moments at one of its two key proponents. Indeed, the one who popularized the phrase, the new perspective, that we can say for sure, and that is uh, Jimmy or James Dunn. Right? He was a long-term theologian at uh, Durham and uh, has published widely in the New Testament and probably ranks among the top three or so New Testament theologians in the contemporary age. Anyway, let's, uh, let's start off with the fact that, that Dunn's starting point is his acceptance of Sanders. You may remember when we talked about Sanders how widely accepted his conclusions were on Judaism, not on Paul, but on Judaism. And you can see that also with this quote from Dunn. He writes, The character characterization of that religion, namely Judaism, as legalistic and merit-based was misconceived unjustified and prejudicial. This was the new perspective on Paul. In reality, it was a new perspective on Paul's Judaism. But it called for a new perspective on Paul himself. If Paul was not reacting to a legalistic Judaism which ultimately understood salvation to be dependent on human achievement, then what was he, that is, Paul, reacting to? A couple of uh, things about this quote. One, you can see that he um, agrees and endorses the claims of Sanders about the NPJ, the New Perspective on Judaism. And you can see again how logically it's linked together. So he says, okay, Sanders is right, at least on Judaism, not on Paul. And if Sanders is right, if that means that Paul, with his phrase, especially the works of the law, or the works in general, could not have been addressing a theological problem of legalism or works righteousness, well, what was he arguing against? Right? If that's not the problem, he was arguing against something, what was it? And now Dunn sees an open door for him to offer his answer to that question. Here it is uh, stated a little more explicitly, right? If not legalism, then what is the problem Paul is addressing in his discussions on the law? And Dunn's view is that Paul is not addressing a problem of legalism or works righteousness, so the traditional reformational or Lutheran orthodox view, but rather uh, Paul is addressing a problem of nationalism, nationalism. Dunn argues that when you look carefully at Paul's uh, criticism on the works of the law and elsewhere in his writings, you can see that he singles out three kinds of laws or commandments, those pertaining to circumcision, uh, Sabbath or other uh, holy days or religious calendar, and food, clean and unclean food. And he observes that these are precisely those laws that highlight the Jewish character, the Jewish identity of people. 
How can you tell a Jew from a non-Jew in the first century? Well, the easiest way, the most obvious way, is whether they're circumcised, whether they observe the Sabbath, and whether they follow the purity laws with regard especially to clean and unclean food. And so Dunn calls these laws, or this emphasis by Jewish Christians to turn Gentile Christians into Jews somehow. He refers then to these things as national boundary markers or badges of covenant membership. So just like we have some vocabulary, some key phrases that are associated with the NPJ, the New Perspective on Judaism, E.P. Sanders, things like covenantal gnomism or getting in versus staying in, so also now we have a key phrase or phrases associated with the NPP, the New Perspective on Paul. And these are associated with Dunn, and again his big phrases are national boundary markers or badges of covenant membership. Just as an aside, the, that phrase, the national boundary markers, may trigger something in your mind uh, with regard to something we talked about earlier in our course. In a reading that I uh, had you uh, look over in connection with 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12, it had to do with holiness and discipleship. And in that discussion, I argued that Paul operates with this idea that holiness is a what? Is a boundary marker, right? Separating the people of God from those who are not the people of God, from those who are inside, from those who are outside, to quote some vocabulary from that particular text. And maybe you didn't catch that at the time, but I was deliberately taking this loaded phrase from the discussion of Paul and the Law, boundary markers, and I was infusing it in a, with new meaning in a different context. Now, here's a quote from Dunn himself, which um, clarifies his uh, uh, opinion on, uh, on what he means by these boundary markers or badges. He says, quote, Works of the law are nowhere understood here, either by his Jewish interlocutors or by Paul himself, as works which earn God's favor, as merit amassing observances. They are rather seen as badges. They are simply what membership of the covenant people involves, what mark out Jews as God's people. In other words, Paul has in view precisely what Sanders calls covenantal gnomism. And what he denies is that God's justification depends on covenantal gnomism, namely that God's grace extends only to those who wear the badge of the covenant. So this text, uh, along with, it could have been multiplied from his other uh, writings, shows that, again, Paul is not against circumcision or the Sabbath or the practice of Jewish food and purity laws because they are, now if you were a Reformed person, distinguishing the three types of law, you would say, oh, these are all ceremonial laws that have been fulfilled in the once and for all sacrifice of Christ, right? No, his argumentation would be different. He would be saying Paul's against these things because of their nationalistic impulse, right? That, um, that uh, it highlights too much the Jewish identity and the agenda of some Jewish Christians to turn Gentile Christians into uh, people who were more closely identified with the Jewish people. And so Paul is, on the one hand, uh, speaking positively about the law, and on the other hand, he can speak negatively against the law. So when Paul speaks generally about the law, right, as normative revelation, as God's will revealed to us, as something that we should follow, Paul speaks positively about that, so Dunn claims. But wait a minute, when some people come along, when Jewish Christians or others come along and push especially those laws dealing with Jewish boundary markers, those badges of covenant membership, oh, that Paul speaks negatively and vehemently against. And so this explains how Paul can have a coherent view of the law, saying sometimes positive things about the law, but in certain other contexts speaking negatively. Here's a quote from Th Frank Thielman. So I've told you what Dunn's position is. You've heard from Dunn himself, and now here's a quote from Frank Thielman, which I think nicely summarizes uh, the position of Dunn. Thielman writes, The account of Paul, which Dunn proposed as a substitute, right, a different way of thinking about Paul, claims that Paul worked through the details of his view of the law in the heat of controversy with Jewish Christians who believe that Gentile Christians, in order to maintain a place in the covenant people of God, had to adopt the three works of the law, which served as badges of national Israel. 
circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and dietary observance. Paul's polemic against works of the law, then, is not directed against gaining salvation by doing works, right? the old uh, reformational Lutheran Orthodox view, but, according to Dunn, Paul is against believing that salvation was at least in part contingent upon belonging to national Israel and observing the law as a badge of that status. As a result, Paul's negative statements are directed against a nationalistic misuse of the law rather than against the law itself. Well, uh, that's, I think, given you a good introduction into the new perspective on Paul as advocated by its earliest proponent and the one who popularized the phrase, Jimmy Dunn. How does Tom Wright fit into this picture? Now, who is Tom Wright? Um, actually, this slide is a bit dated because uh, he is no longer a bishop of Durham, a very high position he held. He has moved to a more academic position in um, uh, St. Andrews in Scotland. But uh, Tom Wright has held not only a number of important uh, academic teaching positions, but more importantly, he's waded into two differing but quite dangerous and controversial debates. The first area where he's entered into is the historical Jesus stuff. Maybe you know from your gospel studies the search for the historical Jesus, and perhaps you not only know those that quest, that search that's gone on in the gospel studies, but also appreciate actually how, um, how liberal usually the discussions in those uh, camps are. And so uh, Tom Wright has waded in and he's often defended the historicity, the historical accuracy of the Gospels pertaining to what Jesus said and did. And so usually he's viewed by evangelicals as a hero, right, in those kind of contexts and discussions. But the other area he's waded into is the area on Paul and the law. And interestingly here, his opponents have not come from the left, but from mostly the right. We'll see, and maybe I'll mention this in a minute, especially those in the Reformed camp, not all Reformed Christians, but especially American Presbyterianism, those uh, particularly from the PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America, or the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, those and those like them have had some strong criticisms of uh, Tom. But he's popular, uh, not only because he's entered into these big debates, but he's popular because of his ability to communicate. If you haven't had a chance to hear Tom speak, either live or on uh, tape, uh, you ought to, because uh, he's different than most academic eggheads, right? He speaks with a passion that catches people off guard. He speaks rather extemporaneously, even though he often does still read from a script, but he speaks kind of openly and easily, and he's just as comfortable speaking to uh, fellow academics as he is to a lay audience. Now, he's not quite as popular in his native country of Great Britain as he is here in North America, but he is an extremely uh, well-followed and uh, well-read. By that I mean not him, but people have read a lot of his writings. And as a result, he is a very influential voice in the field of New Testament uh, today. Well, how does he relate to the NPP, the New Perspective on Paul? Well, like Dunn, right, he too begins by accepting, even embracing the views of the NPJ, the New Perspective on Judaism, the claims of Sanders. Here he speaks in his own voice, right, says, Sanders' major point, to which all else is subservient, can be quite simply stated. Judaism in Paul's day was not, as has regularly been supposed, a religion of legalistic works righteousness, if we imagine that it was, and that Paul was attacking it as if it was, we will do a great violence to it, that is Judaism, and to him, that is Paul. The Jew keeps the law out of gratitude as the proper response to grace. Not in other words, in order to get into the covenant, people, but to stay in. Being in, in the first place, was God's gift. This scheme Sanders famously labeled as covenantal nomism, from the Greek word nomos, or law. So you can see from this quote that, again, the new perspective on Paul is intimately dependent on the new perspective on Judaism. So its advocates don't debate that. They take it as an assumed fact. And I stress that because, remember, 
in our discussion, we raised a number of questions about that new perspective on Judaism. We said that, yes, uh, it offered a helpful corrective, but no, it might not uh, be the last word in terms of Judaism, and there may indeed be a second strand within Judaism, one that could be called an acting legalism, and therefore Paul could be responding to not only Jews, but Jewish Christians, right, who had the same kind of perspective. But now let's move ahead. So Wright starts off with Sanders, uh, but he also uh, agrees, uh, not just with Dunn on that, but also in Dunn's view of the law, especially as badges or um, covenant markers. So Wright, like Dunn, views the, quote, works of the law, or more broadly the phrase works, not as wages to earn, ways to earn favor with God, but badges of covenant identity by which one determines who is in the covenant and who is not. Many Jews in Paul's day were clinging to these identity markers, here he mentions two of them, right, Sabbath and circumcision, in a way that made their Jewish identity exclusive. Therefore their exclusivism or ethnocentrism was keeping the promise of God from flowing to the nations. But though uh, Tom Wright agrees with uh, Jimmy Dunn largely on this, there are some emphasis that emerge in his writings, and it's these emphasis, I think, that largely account for his appeal. One is he stresses very much the universal rather than the individual aspect of God's plan of salvation. Uh, Tom Wright is very gifted at creating a more cosmic picture of God's great redemptive plan. And he's very good at tying all of the scriptures together, showing how already in the Old Testament it was foreshadowed and how it was fulfilled in the New Testament, especially the wonderful image of Romans 8, where it isn't just individuals, right, whom God is redeeming, but it's the whole cosmos, it's the whole creation itself. And this universal rather than highly individualistic view of salvation uh, may sound familiar to many of us who come from Reformed circles, but it isn't in many other evangelical or other Christian circles. And so we might not find this so unique or exciting, but uh, for those uh, communities for which this is a rather new or novel thought, uh, they're excited about it, and uh, that's one of the attractions uh, that they have about Tom Wright. And the other one has to do with uh, his emphasis on inclusion. And this ties in a little bit with understanding the new perspective on Judaism. Remember, if you emphasize certain laws that marginalize Gentiles, right, rather than highlighting the oneness or the togetherness between Jew and Gentile, right, it's that theme that Tom also uh, highlights, not only for the then and there of the text in the first century, but for the church today. And in our post modern age, right, in which we have a kind of Rodney King theology where, you know, can't we all just get along? Uh, that also, I think, is not only an appropriate message, but is an attractive one, right, where, where people like the idea of inclusion or ecumenicity. And so those are two features of Dunn, that you, pardon me, of Tom Wright, that you don't see in Dunn, and that also among those other factors that I mentioned account for his uh, success. But having said that, not everybody is excited or happy with uh, Tom Wright. And maybe the best example of some, some opponents are, uh, is the example of John Piper. So John Piper is a well-known uh, preacher and theologian, has published quite a bit in his own right. And in a recent book, he, you can see there, The Future of Justification, a response to N.T. Wright. And he starts off with, well... Uh, rather strong words, it seems to me. He says, My conviction concerning N.T. Wright is not that he's under the curse of Galatians 1, 8 to 9. Okay, well, I don't know if you remember Galatians 1, 8 to 9. It's pretty strong, where Paul says, If anybody, even an angel, comes to you with a different gospel than the one we previously brought to you, let that person be cursed. And so, uh, okay, he's saying, I guess uh, Tom Wright isn't cursed that way. But his, his portrayal of the gospel and of the doctrine of justification in particular is so disfigured that it becomes difficult to recognize as biblically unfaithful. And here's a little more pointed criticism, which uh, directs our attention to the two areas where um, some have uh, had difficulty with Tom Wright. He says a few pages later that it's Piper, Wright's construction of Paul's theology appears to have no place for the imputation of divine righteousness to sinners. 
So um, what's he talking about? Well, Piper appeals to the following statement from Tom Wright, and so we might as well read that, and maybe that can become an occasion to highlight two areas where um, they're connected, uh, but uh, one specific area with two foci, I guess, in Tom's writing that uh, others have found problematic. So here's Tom now speaking. And he's talking about uh, the idea of righteousness. In Greek, it's dikaiosune, right? And notice how Wright tries to define or explain this important key term, righteousness. He says, if we use the language of law court, it makes no sense whatever to say that the judge imputes, imparts, bequeaths, conveys, or otherwise transfers his, that is, the judge, righteousness to either the plaintiff or the defendant. Righteousness is not an object, a substance, or a gas which can be passage, passed across the courtroom. If and when God does act to vindicate his people, his people will then, metaphorically speaking, have the status of righteousness. But the righteousness they have will not be God's own righteousness. That makes no sense at all. So, there are statements like this. Well, first of all, let, so when Tom defines, so the two areas where Tom gets into trouble. One, how he defines righteousness, and then also how that righteousness is or is not given or communicated to uh, believers. So Tom takes righteousness and um, he sees it not so much as, as, a, as, as something that believers have that is given to them through Christ, a kind of a moral status, right? They don't become righteous. He sees it more as a judgment. So as you had in the last quote, there's a, a judgment scene. You have a judge and uh, we, the sinners, are on the hot seat. And wait a minute, um, even though we're guilty, right? The judge declares us righteous. In other words, not that we're morally perfect. No, we're righteous in the sense that the verdict is not going against us. We are vindicated. And so he talks about righteousness, that is Tom Wright, not as something that as we become, but it's a status that God declares we have. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you say, well, that doesn't sound so different, and, and that's exactly the case. We're talking about a pretty nuanced difference here, but for those Christians, and again, those especially from the Reformed faith, right, who have this cherished idea not only of righteousness, but a righteousness, now this is the second area where Tom gets, uh, gets uh, trouble with, a righteousness that is imputed to us. Right? This is the idea that somehow the righteousness of Christ and or of God is somehow transferred to us so that we now are just as righteous as Christ is or just as righteous as God is. And Tom, well, it's not that he is reluctant to say we end up in a status of being righteous, but he doesn't like the words or the texts that are typically used to support such teaching, such as 2 Corinthians 5.21. Instead, Tom will get at more the quality of righteousness that we as Christians have through Romans 6, more through the theme of union with Christ, right? That believers have not only died with Christ, but also have risen with him. And therefore, we share in not only his death to sin, but also we share in his victory and the righteousness, right, uh, of Christ that was accomplished in that victory. And again, uh, some of these differences may be a little bit uh, nuanced, and you may wonder what the big brouhaha is all about, but, but it is the case. Um, when I read, and I've read a number of um, OPC, PCA, um, some American Presbyterian types who have criticized Tom on these things, typically what they are objecting to, or what they use to appeal to, is the Westminster Confession. And when Tom tries to respond to these charges, typically what I hear him respond to is Romans, or maybe Galatians. And it's actually a bit of an ironic twist in which uh, the Reformed faith, which, you know, um, uh, sola scriptura, right? Uh, the idea that we have to get back only to the scriptures rather than any kind of tradition about the church. I, I'm worried, I, I sense almost too much of an eagerness among some to defend the Westminster Confession and its vocabulary with imputation, right? That isn't a, there isn't a Greek verb that, that captures really that idea in an explicit or direct way. And so um, I think that um, 
you know, I think that, of course, there's always truth, you know, uh, or uh, guilt on both sides. And, and maybe, uh, maybe it's more accurate to say that Tom downplays the idea. I don't think he disputes or rejects the idea of somehow Christians get the righteousness or they end up in a status of righteousness. I just think that he's um, a little more hesitant about certain texts that are typically appealed to to defend that opinion. And what's more, I think that the criticism against him is often overstated. Uh, Tom, uh, we, we as evangelical Christians and Reformed Christians have much more in common with Tom than we have different with him. And so uh, I, I'd be a little concerned about some of the hyperbole that has surrounded the criticism of uh, Tom Wright, especially again from Reformed circles. Well, uh, there's lots more that could be said about these things, and if you want to pursue them further, there is indeed a whole Paul page dedicated to the new perspective on Paul. But hopefully, uh, through this presentation, you've been introduced in a summary and hopefully helpful way to what this new, what the NPP, the new perspective on Paul involves, and also have been introduced to its two main proponents, uh, Jimmy or James Dunn and Tom Wright.